the world eaters. Blood for the blood god, skulls for the throne of corn. See in these words a purity of simplicity. No devious tricks, no indulgent excess, no ponderous rot. Only rage, blood, skulls, death. What kind of warrior seeks anything else? One who is distracted, weak. Gaze upon the world eaters and see the savagery and brutality of war embodied, each clad in the crimson and brass of the Lord of Rage and Battle. Open your ears and hear the scream of their chain weapons, the boom of their guns, the roars of their battle tanks and their blood-curdling howls. Smell the gore that cakes their armour, coats their blades and drips from their mouths. Feel the ground beneath your feet tremble, not only with the pounding of charging warriors, but in anticipation of the rivers of blood that will soon fall upon it to quench its thirst. When my lords begin their holy carnage, feel reality itself bend and blur as the scale of the glorious bloodshed severs the bonds between the material and immaterial realms. See with dismay how no amount of death satisfies their lust for killing. Feel dread when they fight on, despite a dozen wounds and more. With rocks and teeth and bare hands should their weapons become choked with torn meat. No terror when their eyes lock with yours. The hatred and rage you see in those bloodshot orbs will be the last thing you ever know. Blood for the blood god, skulls for the skull throne. Corn's Legion. The tale of the World Eaters is one of merciless slaughter and terrible tragedy from its very outset. They have been a brotherhood dedicated to bloodshed since their earliest days, and as the millennia have drawn on, Angron's sons have slipped further and further into the abyss. Before the World Eaters, before Angron, there was the Emperor. He was a being of unknown providence, rising on terror in a time history remembers only as one of terrifying darkness, brutal empires and total anarchy. None even then could say who or what he was, and such questions, when asked in the 41st millennium, have a thousand times a thousand answers, each more outlandish than the last. Yet, all agree that the Emperor possessed godlike physical might, psychic power beyond imagining, and a mind bordering on omniscience. It is said that the Emperor gazed upon humanity with great despair, yet also full of determination that their time of terror would end. For him, nothing less than a new golden age of mankind, founded upon the ideals of reason, justice, unity and honour, would suffice. The Emperor began his great work upon terror. Now known as the Unification Wars, these times were long, brutal and bloody. The Emperor's armies had to defeat countless thousands of techno-barbarian nomad lords, gene-fused tyrant kings, cybertech despots and vivisector demagogues who ruled their empires with terrible cruelty and were willing to carry out the most hideous atrocities without remorse. As the emperor prevailed against each of his foes, he claimed all the dark technologies they possessed. He was determined to put them to use for all humanity, knowing that only he could create the ultimate warriors that would be needed to conquer the galaxy. The Emperor eventually used his spoils of war to create the twenty Primarchs, of which Angron was one. Each was a demigod in their own right, possessed of a towering stature and strength, incredible capacity for strategy and learning, and preternatural aura of authority. They would be the perfect generals, each with their own talents and preferences. Some even speculate today that each Primarch was imbued with an element of the Emperor's own personality. If this is true, then Angron possessed the Emperor's more warlike and brutal aspects, unstoppable and remorseless when turned to wrath. His physique was capable of enduring horrific punishment and inflicting even worse in return. The Emperor called his Primarchs his sons, yet before his plan could come to fruition, they were scattered across the galaxy by dark, unknown forces, while still fetal. Determined not to stop his grand project, the Emperor continued his work without his foremost creations, 
using their genetic material to create the post-human warriors known as Space Marines. These were formed into twenty legions, the Legionis Astartes. Each of them descended from a different Primarch they would come to call their father. When the Emperor launched his great crusade to reconquer the galaxy, these Space Marines fought at the forefront. Few indeed among the World Eaters care for their legion's ancient history or maintain records from that distant time. And those Imperial scholars with permission to research such matters must consult forbidden tomes held deep within locked vaults. Doing so has revealed the scions of Angron with the Twelfth Legion, and what can be learned of their activities in the time before their Primarch was rediscovered is ominous indeed. It seems that the Twelfth were always destined to be the blood-soaked traitors they would later become. The Twelfth Legion were infamous for their brutal methods long before they turned their backs on the Emperor. Their name was synonymous with terror and bloodshed on a scale that horrified even the most hardened warriors, and they were to be found at the forefront of some of the Great Crusade's most bitter and vicious battles. Masters of Space Hulk boarding actions, boarding operations in general, forlorn hope missions and mass drop assaults, they had few goals in war beside the total extermination of their foe, and were willing to put entire planetary populations to slaughter. Few legions were considered more savage. When the Twelfth attacked, they carried their assaults to victory through sheer courage and the fury of their violence, paying no heed to the terrible casualties they suffered. Over time, the Twelfth developed a reputation for breaking strategic deadlocks and securing total victory no matter the opposition, and became the Legion of Choice when the growing Imperium discovered a foe whose annihilation was the only solution. It is believed that in this time the Emperor himself called the Twelfth his warhounds for their fury, tenacity and savagery. The Legion embraced this reputation, but doing so came with a price. They recruited particularly aggressive, competitive and hot-blooded individuals, resulting in the need for an extremely harsh code of discipline. Even this measure merely controlled, but did not eliminate, bloodshed between Legion brothers. Rumours circulated that the Twelfth slew allies on occasion, and they came to be thought of as unpredictable and intemperate towards other Imperial forces, including their fellow legions. As a result, they were kept away from conflicts in which restraint was required, and were distanced from other forces. The expeditionary fleets of the Twelfth became dumping grounds for the most dangerous Imperial fighting units, those that few commanders desired responsibility for, including abhuman brutes, feral head-takers, cannibalistic technomads, and even the most murderous of Titan legions. Drawing these savage forces together to avoid short-term problems proved to be a mistake that cost humanity to this very day. After being flung from terror in his amniotic pod, Angron found himself on the world of Nuceria, ruled over by sadistic techno-barbarian tyrants, it was a place of abject poverty and brutality. To keep the destitute masses in line, the world's elite put on an endless series of bloody gladiatorial games, each more imaginatively cruel than the last. It was to Angron's eternal misfortune that he was discovered by a slaver, who recognised the boy as a formidable warrior thanks to the Xenos corpses that surrounded him. Soon, Angron found himself upon the sands of Nuceria's arenas, a spectacle and plaything for uncaring monsters, and a populace who cared nothing for those they deemed below them. Angron lived in the cells beneath Nuceria's greatest arena, with thousands of other gladiators. At first he was considered a novelty by Nuceria's people, and was expected to die like all warriors of the arena, but he never did. His fighting prowess swiftly won him favour with the crowds, and he became the best gladiator on the planet. Angron was also favoured by his fellow gladiators, with whom he developed a strong comradeship. Though the fighters of the arena were no more than slaves, they had a sense of honour and dignity that Angron greatly admired. No warrior resented the thought of being slain by another, for it was an unavoidable part of their reality and the gladiators afforded each other the respect and decency 
never shown them by their cruel masters. One of many ways in which the high riders, the elite of Nuceria, uh, tormented their slave warriors was the implementation of the butcher's nails. These psychosurgical devices were fixed deep within a gladiator's brainstem and augmented their aggression to inhuman levels. As a being already capable of immense violence, the butcher's nails turned Angron into a beast brimming with barely controlled rage. They only drove his hatred of the High Riders to new heights, and eventually he led his fellow gladiators in revolt. Angron and Nuceria's gladiators killed their guards, destroyed armies and burned settlements, earning the moniker Eater of Cities. Though many died, they did so gladly, knowing they died free. Despite the successes of Angron's slave host, they were ultimately no match for the well-equipped armies of the technologically advanced High Riders. Angron's warriors fought their way into the cold mountains, worn down by hunger, sickness and attrition, knowing that death would soon find them. Though they dug their own graves in a statement that they would fight to their bitter end against their former overlords. Unbeknownst to Angron, however, the Emperor was in a ship in orbit, having at long last found the latest of his scattered sons, and he had no intention of letting Angron be killed in a futile conflict. As the former slaves and Nusirian armies went to do battle for the final time, Angron was teleported aboard an Imperial vessel. He has never forgiven the Emperor for tearing him away without mercy. Explanation, more apology, leaving his comrades to die. Angron has been racked with bitter hatred and guilt ever since, for betraying his warriors and losing the chance to die free on a field of his own choosing, alongside those he loved most. For reasons lost to time, Angron never spent any time with the Emperor to undergo tutelage after being discovered, none like many of the other Primarchs. Nor did he spend time learning from or forming brotherly bonds with those other Primarchs already discovered. Instead, he was given his legion, one he did not ask for and could not respect, for none of his sons had fought upon the sands of Nuceria. None had experienced what he had experienced. Angron's first reaction to his new situation was rage. His sons, the Warhounds, initially rejoiced at the discovery of their gene sire, but Angron cut down in cold blood any who approached him. He only mellowed enough to take command of the Legion after Khan, commander of the Ape for Salt Company, spoke with him at length, managing to reach past the Primarch's rage where others could not. Angron decreed that, as those who fought with him on New Syria had been eaters of cities, so his gene sons would be known as eaters of worlds. To his new legionaries, Angron was a war messiah, and in every way they aspired to emulate him. They were inspired by the potential for inhuman violence that radiated from their gene sire, as well as his berserk fury, fearsome charisma, and strength of conviction. Angron was, to them, the ultimate warrior. He became their judge, their general, and their king. When Angron ordered that the butcher's nails should be replicated and implanted into the brain of every one of his legionaries, his tech marines and apothecaries did not hesitate. Though it took countless bloody experiments, they were successful, and soon thousands of legionnaires were implanted with the nails, knowing this would bring them closer to their father. Yet for his part, Angron never grew comfortable with the adoration his sons had for him, refusing to be called Lord or any other accolade. As commander of the Twelfth, Angron took an already violent brotherhood and remade it in his own brutal image. Failures to conquer worlds were punished with decimations in the ranks. Virtually all training was conducted with live ammunition and sharpened blades. The attrition rate amongst aspirants was so high that World Eater's apothecaries had to utilise rare and unstable technologies to induct enough new warriors to maintain the Legion's strength. Thanks to Angron's influence, the World Eaters excelled in close quarters fighting, to an even greater extent than before, mastering techniques taught to them by their Primarch. A cult of personal combat 
overtook the Legion, to the extent that even artillery crews were encouraged to lay into their foe with bayonet and knife, if granted the opportunity. All differences were settled in gladiatorial arenas, and the Legion's already stringent discipline was made harsher still to maintain order. Officers whose orders were disobeyed had to execute the insubordinate on the spot. The Twelfth's dark reputation became ever darker. Their name was linked to slaughter after slaughter, and Angron was censured for the use of the nails, and later for wiping out an entire world's population in a single night during the Gahana Scouring. As punishment for his deed, Angron was ordered far to the galactic north of his legion, before the Emperor tasked Horus with bringing Angron back into the Imperial fold to face further reckoning. By then, however, Horus had already turned against his father, and in Angron he found an all-too-willing ally. The World Eaters were one of the first legions to join Horus in his betrayal of the Emperor. Thousands of World Eaters, who may have retained loyalty to the Master of Mankind, were slain in the Great Betrayal at Isvan Free, and the Twelfth later participated in the massacre at Isvan V. The World Eaters truly unleashed the darkness within themselves after their treachery. Breaking their oaths of loyalty, they freed them to entertain brutal desires they had barely considered before. More and more of the Legion's number practiced gory blood rituals, and taking of skulls took hold, and the apothecaries developed ever more extreme versions of the butcher's nails. Many world eaters openly gave themselves over to the worship of corn. It was also during this time that Angron ascended to demonhood, when he and the traitor Primarch Lorgar carved bloody paths through the loyalist realm of Ultramar. After a titanic duel with Rebute Gilliman, in which Angron fell into a blinding rage, Lorgar used the Red Angel's fury as a conduit for a dark ritual. Angron was suffused with the powers of chaos, becoming the demon Primarch he is to this day. Though little is known of the World Eaters' actions during the dark days of the Horus heresy, it is evident, from those few sources that remain, that the Twelfth were at the leading edge of every assault, and that carnage in and of itself became their only goal. It is known that the World Eaters were present at the Siege of Terra, reaping a bloody harvest and perhaps even being the first to breach the walls of the Imperial Palace. Despite their combined ferocity, however, the traitors were ultimately defeated, and the World Eaters were forced to withdraw. After the Siege of Terra, the World Eaters were in disarray, separated from Angron. They maintained a semblance of unity, only in an effort to avoid their utter annihilation at the hands of vengeful loyalists and opportunistic traitors. Khan, the great warrior who had won over Angron years before, had been mortally wounded during the siege of the Emperor's palace, and hovered now upon the edge of death in a coma. No other warrior had the strength and reputation required to unite the Legion, and bitter disagreements raged between the various surviving officers. Added to the total lack of supplies, the pounding of the nails, claiming the sanity of more and more warriors, and the damage to its fleet caused by the brutal fighting around the Sol system. This disunity made the Legion incredibly vulnerable. The potential for conflict between the surviving World Eaters only increased when they encountered a much larger fleet of the Emperor's children over an unnamed world. As Angron's sons considered whether to fight these turncoat scions of the Primarch Fulgrim, Khan awoke. At first, an uneasy truce was struck with the Emperor's children, but this quickly crumbled and war erupted. Khan named the planet Scalathrax. In the language of Nagrakali, which the World Eaters use as a common tongue, this meant the place of judgment, or simply destruction. The fighting on Scalathrax was heavily dictated by the planet's dangerous climate, with the nights drawing in so cold that even the Space Marines had to largely cease combat to take cover. Despite this, the campaign proved no less bloody than any that had come before. 
Though the Empress' children were numerous and better organised, the sheer, bloody-minded determination and ferocity of the World Eaters saw the war turn in their favour. The conflicts start-stop nature proved frustrating for the World Eaters, however, the butcher's nails pounding in their minds and demanding continued slaughter. Khan was no less affected, and on what was later called the Night of Madness, he lost control. Taking up a flamer, he ran through the World Eaters' positions and burned his brothers from their cover to drive them into battle. Khan hacked down those who sought to stop him, his actions inspiring many others to turn on their brothers to force them to fight. A domino effect followed in which more World Eaters fell into a blood craze and the Scions of Angron lost all cohesion. Twelfth Legion blood flowed. That night of bloodshed shattered the World Eaters into countless warbands, squads and individuals. Some abandoned Scalathrax quickly, with no interest in fighting to the death for no gain. In fighting, racked dozens of detachments, with brothers who wanted to stay clashing with those who wished to escape. Thanks to Khan's madness, the World Eaters were broken apart for good. It has been 10,000 years since the Twelfth Legion's fragmentation at Scalathrax, and now the World Eaters are all but unrecognisable from the warriors they were in the Great Crusade. This is in no small part due to the influence of the Butcher's Nails, which have been warp-corrupted and ever-experimented on by those insane operatives collectively known as the Berserker Surgeons. These individuals are the inheritors of the legacy set down by the apothecaries and tech marines who first developed the butcher's nails for legionary implantation. In the mind of a world eater, the link between pleasure and killing is unbreakable thanks to the nails. And when the sons of Angron are not at war, these horrific devices twist in their brains, demanding blood. Only in death does the nails' endless grinding relent. Tick, tick, tick. Each World Eater's warband operates in a different manner. Some strike out from well-defended territories and fortresses, others from a single ship or mighty armada. With so much of their focus purely given over to killing, maintaining these resources has proven to be an impossible task for many legionnaires, who instead steal what vessels they can, or seek passage with other heretic Astartes who can promise them bloody wars. The warriors of the Twelfth care for little more than slaughter, carnage and the taking of skulls in corn's name. They retain barely any control of their own impulses, thanks to the endless pounding of the nails and the corruption of the warp. And in battle, any sense of cohesion within a warband often collapses within minutes of fighting commencing. Most world eaters favour brutal chain weaponry, whose grinding teeth whirr at such a speed they can gnaw through armour, bone and rockcrete. But they are more than willing to fight with fists, teeth, nails and stones if necessary. At their most extreme moments, World Eaters legionnaires have been known to turn their blades on their fellows, or even themselves, to spill blood for their deity. The World Eaters are so obsessed with violence that most neglect their weapons and armour, considering basic maintenance work a waste of energy that can be better spent killing. Thus, their scratched and battered power armour is typically coated in layer upon layer of dried gore, and the same is true of the armour plating of their battle tanks and transports. Some warbands fight themselves to extinction, lacking the desire or resources, or perhaps both, to utilise new recruits. Those who retain enough presence of mind to sustain their warband's continued existence largely rely upon the demented berserker surgeons, who know more about the implantation of the nails than any others. They may also utilise the accelerated recruitment techniques the Legion used during the Great Crusade, as well as forbidden methods granted to them after Istvan V. Some have even learned heinous practices involving demonic packs to create new Chaos Space Marines. Berserker surgeons operate across the galaxy, working with different Chaos Lords to create homicidal maniacs who have no concept of fear, pain or death. Some World Eater warbands 
expand their numbers using devotees of corn, not hailing from the 12th Legion. And these individuals also undergo the psychosurgeries practised by the berserker surgeons, a process they see as a kind of apotheosis that bring them closer to their wrathful god. Since the opening of the Great Rift, the World Eaters have never been more active. Prosperous and fortified worlds have fallen silent. Shipping lanes, once alive with merchantmen, have become barren trails haunted by ghosts. Entire choirs of astropaths have torn themselves apart with their bare hands as terrifying images of slaughter and blood have filled their minds and driven them to madness. The World Eaters' bloodthirsty actions have seen their ranks swelled with fanatical newcomers, many more aspirants having been ripped from conquered worlds and captured ships and subjected to the nails. They have seized countless slaves and drawn mortal followers to their banners in equal measure. And the sons of Angron are now stronger than ever. The galaxy itself shudders at the thought of what they are capable of. Corn, the blood god, the taker of skulls, the lord of battle, the master of the brass throne. By all these titles and more is Corn known. He is a god of anger, violence and war, the manifestation of the murderous, irrational aspects of sentient beings. Every hate-filled blow and brutal killing in the galaxy's long and bloody history is a tribute to the blood god. Corn is most frequently depicted as a gargantuan figure wearing ornate armour of black and brass, wielding a massive double-handed sword that flickers with inner fires. A heavy helmet sits upon his head, and his body is broad and heavily muscled, with a snarling, hound-like visage. King of war that he is, Corn is most often shown sitting upon a great brass throne atop an enormous mountain of skulls amidst a sea of splintered bones and oceans of thick blood. His followers recognise him as a being of insatiable rage and incomparable power. His every word is a growl of inexhaustible fury, and his roar is one of pure bloodlust. Corn's bellows of anger echo throughout time and space, and as the embodiment of mindless and absolute violence, he destroys anyone within reach. Given these qualities, the fact that across the galaxy trillions fight for little more than the continuation of slaughter, there is no shortage of new followers for Corn. War wears down any concept of decency and compassion in a being if given enough time, and once these notions have decayed in a soldier's mind, they become open to the howling, hate-driven oaths of the blood god. Corn's devotees are ferocious warriors, eager to kill in their patron's name, and live up to his standards. His followers justify their lives and seek to prove themselves to him through honour, bravery and martial pride, though the most fanatical know that Corn cares for little besides total slaughter. Indeed, most of the Lord of Battle's worshippers conquer through no more than brute force. The majority favour blades, mauls, axes and other melee weapons, even fitting their armoured vehicles with flails and scythes. Though these tactics are invariably costly, Korn's servants care not for casualties on their own side, for these deaths just grant more blood and skulls to their patron. Devoted to bloodshed as they are, the blood god's hordes rarely construct temples, for such efforts are to them a waste of time and effort that are better spent killing. Many fear that a day spent without butchery in Korn's name will swiftly be rewarded with the blood god's wrath. The sheer brutality, favoured by Corn, and thus his followers, leaves little room for other notions, and has resulted in fierce rivalries, and often open war, between the servants of the Blood God and those of other deities of the Chaos Pantheon. The sorcery and scheming of Zench is hated, as is the self-indulgence of the Dark Prince, Slanesh. In many ways, the cult of Corn is one of purity, for such devotees, blood, slaughter and battle is all there is, and all there ever should be. Angron, the Red Angel, Demon Primarch of the World Eaters.
the most bloody and savage of all Primarchs, Angron, his titanic rage and apocalyptic war made manifest in a single terrifying being. Those who stand against him face an unstoppable monster, one who knows nothing but hate, fury and an insatiable desire to kill. He is the crimson storm that destroys all in its path in a tempest of gory violence. Over the course of his miserable and tormented life, Angron had been known by many names. The Conqueror, the Lord of the Red Sands, the Slaughterer of Nations and more. All relate to his terrifying martial skill and penchant for horrific violence. Wherever these names and titles are whispered, it is with great fear, for Angron has been a bane of the Imperium and Xenos empires alike for ten thousand years. For all of his butchery, however, Angron reserves his strongest hatred for himself and what he has become. He has always craved freedom. At first he was a slave to the High Riders, then to the Emperor. Now Angron sees himself as a slave to his own rage and desire for conflict, and to the Blood God. It is a tragic irony that these things also empower him and so bind him more tightly with every kill. Yet the most brutal fact of Angron's existence is that the greatest sense of freedom he now feels only comes to him in fleeting moments of truly mindless slaughter, which grant him a kind of peace. These moments are all too rare, however, for Angron's very essence burns at the thought he can never be free from life itself. Angron cares nothing for the weapons he carries, seeing them merely as tools to be wielded only for as long as they prove useful. The demon Primarch's strength and ferocity are so great that no weapon, however mighty or masterfully crafted, can withstand his use of them for long. As such, Angron has wielded many different weapons over the millennia, but is presently known to carry the demon sword Samni Arius and the chain axe spine grinder. Known also as the Blade of the False Gladiator, Samne Arius, it takes its name from the prideful Slaneshi demon bound within its form. This being once controlled a world in the Eye of Terror, that it had transformed into a twisted network of gladiatorial arenas, wherein it tortured and butchered its foes for millennia. It brought only the most skilled warrior slaves into its domain, delighting in shattering their minds and bodies over successive duels before finally removing their heads. Samni Arias boasted that no warrior could best it upon the sands, whether demon or mortal. Angron was enraged by this claim, seeing the demon's actions as no different to those of the high riders upon New Syria. Moreover, he was repulsed by the thought of a demon of Slanesh being seen as greater than any warrior of corn. Armed with nothing but a bar of unworked iron, Angron bludgeoned Samne Arius to death in a contest lasting mere minutes. At the moment of the demon's death, Angron's weapon warped in his hands. The simple iron bar became a mortifarious blade, <laughs> glowing white hot as Samne Arius's soul was bound and folded within it. The weapon's tip still dripping with the demon's hissing essence, split and twisted into a pair of vicious hooks that resembled the horns of some mighty beast. Around Angron's bloody fist, a brazen hilt formed in the shape of the symbol of corn, and the sword's sharpened length bulged with the skulls of every foe the Slaneshi demon had ever bested, infusing the weapon with their combined skill and power. The savage chain axe Spine Grinder is also called Perseax's Folly by some, this name deriving from the corn worshipping Dark Mechanicum adepts of Perseax, who spent decades constructing it. Tens of thousands died extracting the rare Indomitiate needed to forge the weapon, which they offered upon their knees to Angron as tribute to the one they worshipped as a god of murder. To any champion of corn, the chain axe would have been a gift beyond anything they could possibly have received in the mortal realm. Two sets of adamantine sheathed macro drake teeth make up its chain links, enveloped in a power field that thrums like the beating of eight thousand times 
eight thousand rageful hearts. It is a weapon, capable of slaying god engines and tearing through the walls of ferrocrete bastions. The Red Angel had nothing but scorn for it. However, disgusted by the weakness the adept showed in their attempts to appease him, and their wasting of so much energy that could have been dedicated to slaughter. Thus, new axe in hand, he butchered the mewling beings who had so pathetically presented it to him. In doing so, Angron reasoned, the adepts of Persiax were finally making a worthy offering to Korn, that of their blood. Ever since the emergence of the Great Rift, real space has been saturated with warp energy. Thanks to this, those demons in possession of an indomitable will and an unslackable thirst for killing can conquer the bounds of reality itself. Angron is one such being. Should his physical form be destroyed, even by powerful orbital defence weaponry, he can bind his broken flesh back together through an act of furious will. Even should Angron somehow be cast into the warp, there is little respite for his foes. The most malignant truth is now believed by a growing number of imperial priests and inquisitors, one realised only through the observance of dread portents and much sacrifice in lives. Hunted all the while by those who denounce them as heretics for their theories, such individuals whisper that Angron cannot be truly banished. The believers speak of the eight crimson omens that seemingly herald Angron's return, including horrors such as the blood rain, the storm of hate, and the flesh-brand plague. Each is more gruesome than the next, occurring only upon sites that have experienced the most apocalyptic bloodshed in their history. Some theorise that it is the energies reverberating across the galaxy from the Cicitrix Maledictum that have resulted in it being impossible to banish Angron. Others propose more ancient explanations that are stranger still. Whatever the case, theorists agree on one thing. Once heralded by the Crimson Omens, Angron's return to real space always occurs, with terrifying inevitability. Eight weeks, eight days, and eight hours after he was last cast from reality. Khan, the Betrayer All I see is red! Khan has dedicated his life to unleashing bloody carnage. He is drawn by the scent of war, as a hungering hound is drawn by fresh meat, and it has become impossible to tally his slaying. For ten millennia, he has been Korn's most ardent heretic Astartes champion, living only to slay for the Blood God. No world eater doubts that Khan is exalted in the eyes of the Blood God. Many claim he is the embodiment of the Eightfold Path of Korn. His mantra, Kill, maim, burn, has been the death knell for hundreds of worlds. The betrayer's rage is palpable as he thunders into battle, hacking down all in his path, shrugging off ferocious blows and lopping off limbs and heads in a raging storm of bloodshed. He has single-handedly turned the tide of countless apocalyptic conflicts after laying low mighty space marine heroes, pulping the heads of wise Eldar Farseers, slaughtering leering hive tyrants or eviscerating savage orc warlords. Lesser foes he butchers in droves with great sweeps of his chain axe, gore child, or with hails of plasma bolts. Truly, he is a bestial engine of destruction, a primal force of murder. Though Khan appears to have been slain on countless occasions, he always reappears again on another gore-soaked battlefield, giving rise to the belief that he has been somehow chosen by the Blood God as a kind of avatar. When Angron was found and united with his legion, it was Khan who somehow soothed the Primarch's rage enough for him to take command of his sons. Khan swiftly became Angron's equerry, and there were none in the legion more loyal to their Primarch. Khan idolised the Red Angel, convinced that it was the purpose of the World Eaters to emulate and serve Angron in every possible way. As such, he was the first legionary to be implanted with the Butcher's Nails. After becoming Angron's equerry, 
the respect Khan received from his legion brothers became admiration. Later, he was seen as essential to the legion's future existence, with Angron's instability proving more and more dangerous. Angron listened to few besides Khan, and none could bring the Primarch back from insanity in the same way as him, if at all. Yet Khan was far from immune to his own rages, first succumbing to the nails on the bloody battlefields of Isvan Free. Upon Scalifrax, this came to a head terribly, and with chain axe and flamer, he shattered the world eaters for good. Though some of the Legion still admire Khan, he has earned the moniker Betrayer, and is now cursed as much as he is revered. Though Khan is an infamous slaughterer, he is not always possessed by berserk rage. When he is not howling with wrath, his voice is low and measured, even soft. His calm face is long and serious, with a nobility that belies his murderous capabilities. Khan retains all the tactical brilliance he has ever had. When in control of his senses, he is capable of wielding fleets and armies of Chaos Space Marines and their mortal followers with great nuance and skill. Yet, like Angron before him, Khan rejects titles and honours, and though he remains a figurehead of a kind for many world eaters, he seeks no part in any kind of leadership. Those who follow him do so of their own free will, and he cares not if they die. Khan's is a soul conflicted. He believes his legions should not fight against their nature as destroyers, and continues to slay for the blood god as Angron ordered ten millennia ago with a kill counter built into his helmet's display feed. Yet, on rare occasions, Khan wonders if the World Eater's existence is one torturous, never-ending nightmare from which they can never wake. A handful of World Eaters even speculate whether the Betrayer's actions on Scalifrax were somehow deliberate in order to shatter the Legion and prevent it from becoming even worse. Once wielded by Angron, the chain axe known as Gorechild was discarded by the Primarch after he had unleashed so much deranged ferocity through it that it was reduced to little more than scrap metal. Khan saw to it that the weapon was repaired and has wielded it ever since. Gorechild possesses an adamantium haft and jagged teeth torn from the jaws of mica dragons from the planet Luther McIntyre. With it, Khan can cut a space marine in half from head to groin without difficulty, and the number of skulls he has claimed with it over the millennia is beyond count. Many world eaters see possession of Gorechild as a mark of the right to rule the Legion, at least when Angron does not demand they fight for him. And Khan has butchered hundreds of upstart challengers who dared pit themselves against his unrivaled rage and brutality. To this day, the Betrayer is unmatched in the Legion, his skill and fury undeniable. Nevertheless, Khan remains ever watchful for pretenders who would dare attempt to pry the Red Angel's axe from his hands. Though Khan's name is muttered with hatred by many world eaters, even ten thousand years after the events at Scalathrax, just as many speak it with reverence. Many followers of the Blood God seek out Khan to fight beside him and win favour from Khorne and their Legion brothers by association. These warriors, made up of both World Eaters and corn worshipping renegades, are collectively known as the Butcher Horde. There is no force of World Eaters in the galaxy more dangerous than the Butcher Horde. Each warrior strives to be more like Khan than the last, and all are utterly devoted to the worship of Khorne. They willingly embrace the ceaseless demands of the butcher's nails, uh, charging into the fray without care for themselves or each other, chain blades roaring. Once they reach enemy lines, the butcher horde become a tornado of slaughter, each warrior hacking and cleaving their way through all who oppose them with an unquenchable bloodthirst and a thunderous rage. Such is the power of the butcher horde's unleashed ferocity that they have crushed forces many times their own number, often over terrain completely to their disadvantage, ranging from orc hordes, tyrannid swarms, 
Nostari kindreds to Astra Militarum tank regiments and even other World Eaters warbands. Though the Butcher Horde slay countless foes whenever they fight, their own casualties are invariably catastrophic, so that the attrition rate of their members over the millennia has been great. Khan's warriors will not hesitate to charge headlong into enemy cannon fire, go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the most dangerous monsters or battle walkers, or storm the most formidable fortresses or battleships. Those who survive all this also have to contend with Khan himself, who slaughters many he fights beside in his furious rages. Rarely is there a battle that can sate Khan's bloodlust. When victory is won, he almost always turns on those who follow him to war. Lord Invocatus, the Winged Axe, Corn's Thunderbolt. A born marauder, Lord Invocatus is a master of devastating hit and run attacks, thundering through the air as if riding across solid ground, turning the skies to fire and roiling bloodstorms with his passing. Lord Invocatus descends into the battle atop his mighty juggernaut. At his back is his warband, the Fire Riders, borne aloft by the blessings of Corn. Not even the World Eaters of his own warband know Lord Invocatus's origins. Speculation on this matter also runs rife amongst those of the wider legion who know of him, their number growing with each of his spectacular victories. Some say Lord Invocatus belonged to the Warhounds before the Emperor discovered Angron, while others claim he is some recent turncoat renegade, yet all agree that his successes, should they continue, will propel him to demonhood. Lord Invocatus's bolt pistol and chain axe are named Trickster's Doom and Coward's Bane, respectively, and countless are those who have been slain by one or the other of these potent weapons. Coward's Bane is a peerless artificer axe, perfectly balanced and aerodynamic, its extended handle ideal for cavalry warfare. So great is Invocatus's martial skill that he wields the weapon completely ambidextrously, switching hands mid-duel to catch his enemies unawares, or striking down foes on either side of his mount as he thunders into combat. By the dark blessings of the Blood God, Invocatus and those who follow him storm into battle, bestriding burning skies, giving rise to the warband being named the Fire Riders. Bursting from the embarkation decks of Invocatus's flagship, the Red Blade Rider, the Fire Riders sweep down upon their unsuspecting foes with supernatural speed. None anticipate cornate warriors, armoured transports and predacious aircraft descending from on high in such a manner. Mobility is essential to Lord Invocatus and the Fire Riders. Without it, their raids would quickly become bogged down, with successful hit-and-run strikes becoming impossible. While other World Eater warlords scorn Invocatus's tactics as cowardly and uncommitted to true slaughter, they fail to appreciate the lethality of his methods. Invocatus has seen many a World Eater's warband get sucked into conflicts that have descended into hunts for lone survivors across corpse-strewn battlefields when they could have been pursuing fresh butchery elsewhere. By contrast, the winged axe strikes swiftly and moves on, seeking always to maximise the amount of blood he and his warriors shed. To him, effort spent purging a world to its last soul is wasted if a worthier target can be found and destroyed elsewhere. The methods of war employed by Lord Invocatus require a level of coordination that even disciplined and highly ordered forces would be hard-pressed to achieve. For an army of world eaters, such a state of affairs might be thought of as all but impossible, yet Invocatus possesses a terrifyingly singular will that manifests as an almost supernatural control over his followers. He is a master of the precisely timed assault, knowing exactly when and where to apply the correct amount of force and then to withdraw. Yet for all the subtlety and nuance such methods require, Invocatus is still a world-eater, and with each moment he spends manoeuvring his forces, his killing fury builds. When he and his warriors strike, this wellspring of wrath is explosively unleashed, 
Invocatus and the Fire Riders demolishing all before them in a storm of bloodshed that leaves the few survivors catatonic with shock. Alongside his ironclad self-control, Lord Invocatus possesses a predator's instincts for spotting and outwitting enemy traps and ambushes. Many a wily commander will present a weak front, only to reveal in the heat of battle a hidden core of elite warriors ready to annihilate any who take the bait. Invocatus not only has the preternatural talent for detecting such schemes, but reserves a deep well of hatred for those who attempt to employ them. Complementing this, Invocatus wears the Bloodstorm Helm, through whose crimson-tinged sight he is able to perceive the nervously beating hearts and duplicitous thoughts of hidden enemies, as though they were empiric signal flares. Once the skull of the demon Gakor, whose essence is now bound within it, the helmet is said to have been crafted for one who has earned the mantle of Korn's own huntsman. Combining this powerful artefact with his innate gifts, Lord Invocatus can see even the most elaborate or well-crafted ambush before it is sprung. Being a warrior of Korn, Invocatus's ways of dealing with such duplicity is to punish it with brute force. Knowing the location of the ambushers, the winged axe leads his warriors headlong into the trap like a mailed gauntlet thrust down a monster's gullet to rip out its beating heart. Invocatus directly assaults the foe's revealed positions, overrunning them and spreading panic and bloodshed, as those who thought themselves predators now realise they are prey. These tactics invariably result in massive casualties for Invocatus' forces, but to him, this is acceptable, for every death spills blood for corn. Lord Invocatus's tactics have won him innumerable victories and claimed countless skulls for the Blood God. One of his most infamous triumphs was over the Death Watch of the Watch Fortress called Ebon Vale. The World Eaters poured from the skies in a gore-slick tide, joined by the demon engines of the Brazen Beast's renegade warband. Though the Watch Fortress's defences were elaborate, with multiple concealed sally points and cleverly designed bottlenecks, Invocatus identified them all. His warriors slaughtered hundreds of loyalists and stripped their armories bare of war gear and artefacts before the master of the Fire Riders ordered their withdrawal to seek out fresh hunting grounds. There are few of the Winged Axe's victories that display his disregard for his followers more than that achieved in the Rengar system. There, Lord Invocatus and his forces tore apart a Hrud migration fleet, but their own casualties were horrific. Those who did not succumb to the aliens' weapons wasted away to dust, thanks to the Hrud's time-distorting powers. No World Eater, barring Invocatus, survived the battle. Lord Invocatus rides to war upon the demon steed Kalgareth. Sparks and flame burst wherever Kalgareth's brass-shod hooves strike. Its eyes burn with wrathful bloodlust and smoke belches from its nostrils. Invocatus won this juggernaut steed, along with the Bloodstorm Helm, long before he became famous within his legion. After completing the mysterious deeds, he collectively calls the Road of Eight Bloody Steps. The demon Gakor once rode Kalgareth, and without that entity's enduring presence within the Bloodstorm Helm, Invocatus could never hope to master his mount in war. Thanks to the helm, Lord Invocatus can feel all that Kalgareth feels, and the bond between warrior and steed has become strong. He knows how the juggernaut hungers to kill, and never fails to give the beast the opportunity. Kalgareth possesses all of the rage and hatred of its kind, and these traits only spur Lord Invocatus on in battle, fueling him like a kind of drug. It takes every ounce of Invocatus' strength to resist both the pounding of the nails and the primal urges of his demonic mount. But as yet, he has not once lost control in battle. To Invocatus' mind, only the worthy can ride such a mighty beast of the Blood God, proving their strength through their ability to assert their dominance. It is through the unknowable powers of the Juggernaut, and those of corn flowing through it, 
that Lord Invocatus is able to race across the sky with his host of warriors in tow. Wherever Invocatus rides, a sky bridge of fire, blood and smoke appears in his wake, bearing his followers into battle. Ever since Scalifrax, the World Eaters have been a legion in name only. There are many war bands operating independently from one another. With centralised command all but gone, the scattered sons of Angron have diverged wildly. Nearly 10,000 years have passed since Khan earned the moniker Betrayer for his actions on Scalifrax. There, the battered World Eaters Legion was fragmented forever. Those who survived the horrific slaughter he initiated took whatever ships and weapons they could and, for the most part, never looked back. Even before Angron was discovered and united with his Jean sons during the Great Crusade, the Twelfth was a fractious legion. Order did not come naturally to them. They were quick to anger and utterly intolerant of the smallest of perceived insults. Bloodshed between battle brothers was not uncommon, and to keep this under control, transgressions were brutally punished. Once united with Angron, the Legion's culture only became more bloodthirsty and violent. The Red Angel's code of savage competition took over, and his warriors embraced it wholeheartedly. Angron had taught them the way of the gladiator, schooling his sons in new weapons and new ways to kill. Every legionary sought to be unsurpassed in war, and a cult of personal gladiatorial combat arose, becoming a crux around which each World Eater's life revolved. Disagreements were settled on the Red Sands, where contests over leadership positions also took place, in duels that always went to the death. Though leadership through strength was a core part of the Legion's culture, it existed within a command structure that was reliable and effective, as befitted a Space Marine Legion. Then, after Scalifrax, all such constraints and checks fell away. The main concern of all World Eaters' warbands became survival, and for many, and has remained so. With no purpose or external authority, some degenerated and broke apart as warrior after warrior left to form their own warbands, or became so consumed with infighting and leadership challenges, they destroyed themselves. It is now impossible for anyone, World Eater or otherwise, to know how many of these fragmented warbands exist, or how many warriors make up the Legion's overall strength. Over time, countless warbands have risen and fallen, even as some are destroyed. Others newly form or merge with others, or declare full independence, so that the World Eaters' warriors can never truly be tallied. Many World Eaters' lords have attempted to unite the disparate warbands under one banner through sheer brutality and force of will. Some have succeeded in maintaining coalitions of such kinds, but there is a limit to how far they can go. Eventually, they will be challenged and cut down by a rival, or succumb entirely to the butcher's nails, or find that their many followers become too widespread to assert any real authority over. Only Angron, or perhaps Khan, could truly unite the Legion, but both are too lost to bloodlust to do so. Until a unifying force surfaces, the fragmented warbands of the World Eaters will each carve their own bloody path, diverging ever further into their own methods of war. Gladiator Cadre 331 Exhibiting behaviour, highly unusual amongst the warbands of the World Eaters, the Chaos Space Marines of Gladiator Cadre 331 still wear the white and blue of the Old Legion, although often it is stained red with the blood of slain enemies. The World Eaters of this warband on a corn through skill at arms, aiming to be the very best duelists. For them, more than most, the fighting pits that have been such a significant part of their legion's culture carry an unparalleled sense of honour. They see a great honesty in the arena, where a warrior's strengths and weaknesses are bared for all to see, with no one but themselves to rely upon for victory. Angron's teachings on the rules and traditions of gladiatorial combat resonate even more with the warriors of the Free Free One than with other world eaters, just as the arena fighters of old New Syria once did. The warband's warriors cut a mark on their bodies after every duel, 
beginning at the base of the spine. If victorious, a fighter will allow the corresponding wound to heal normally, becoming red, but will rub dirt into any cuts made after a defeat, causing them to heal black. The resulting scar tissue that coils around the warrior's body is known as the triumph rope. This clinging to ancient ways has led the Free Free One to prize organisation and discipline more highly than most world eaters. As the butcher's nails pulse in their minds, these values give the war band a focus that can prevent them from succumbing to the madness the devices can cause. This has allowed them to surprise many foes. Those expecting to fight a frothing mob of fanatics instead find themselves facing a coherent force of master bladesmen. Starkly different to the rest of their legion in this way, the Free Free One keep themselves distanced from other world eaters. Kestus Thrax, the Warband's commander, once believed the world eaters could reunite around the doctrines he espouses, but the madness of his erstwhile legion brothers has since convinced him that unity is now all but impossible for the Twelfth. The Void Butchers Few World Eaters warbands are as adept in void warfare as the Void Butchers. Under the command of Selakis Mymilo, their leader for some two millennia, they have gone from strength to strength. The warband has embraced a savage joy in the deep intensity of boarding actions and the carnage that follows. When they storm a ship, they fight with relentless momentum, giving their enemies no hope of gaining the initiative or coordinating a defence. The Void Butchers make extensive use of Ursus Claws, enormous harpoons launched from their ships. These are linked to immense chains that the firer can retract, bringing the struck foe closer and rendering them easy to board. Once within an enemy vessel, the Void Butchers strip it of supplies and slaughter or capture all inside. Such actions have earned them not only the enmity of the Imperium, but also the Leagues of Votan and Eldari Corsairs. The Void Butchers are particularly hated by the Rampagers and Black Templar Space Marine chapters, due to my Mello's fondness for seizing prize enemy warships fitting them with Ursus Claws and turning them over to the service of Corn. One such vessel is a Rampager's battle barge that my Mello renamed the Rampager, amusing himself with the irony. The ship had been upgraded by its builders to have dramatically increased speed, which the Void Butchers gladly now use against their enemies. Amongst the other ships captured in this fashion is the Black Templar's frigate, His Indomitable Wrath whose name the Void Butchers have not changed. The Bloodstalkers Commanded by Kulgaz Deadeye, the Bloodstalkers can trace their origin back to the Legion's 89th Reconnaissance Company. Though barely a handful of its members from the time of the Great Crusade still live. By the nature of their battlefield role, they operated at a great distance from the body of the Legion, and so, on Scalafrax, the 89th were far from the epicentre of Khan's betrayal. As a result, the company was able to escape more or less intact. True to the independence of mind needed by scouting forces, the Bloodstalkers' way of war differs much from their fellow warbands, in that they are unusually patient. In part, this is an inheritance from their earliest days as a reconnaissance unit, but it also reflects the influence of Deadeye, who commanded the company even before the unification with Angron, and has always reasoned that killing at range accrues more skulls for corn. Though far from unwilling to engage with pistols and chain blades, and still implanted with the butcher's nails, the Bloodstalkers have little admiration for giving in to berserk rage. That kind of behaviour, to them, is a sure way to be killed sooner, which means fewer opportunities to slay in Korn's name. Those amongst them who lose control to the nails, they often kill immediately. Kalgur's dead eye earned his name for his extreme senses and unique bionics. These grant him the ability to echolocate by the blood flowing through the bodies of living things, enabling him to remain the same master sharpshooter he always was. 
eager to offer skulls to corn like any devotee of the blood god. Deadeye has taught his warriors to make killing shots that do not obliterate the target's head. When battle is done, the bloodstalkers then take their hatchets, cleavers, axes and knives to the necks of the slain and hold high the skulls they claim to honour corn. Axes of the Forge A fleet-based warband, the Axes of the Forge maintain a symbiotic relationship with the Dark Mechanicum cult known as the Thralls of the Eightfold Cog. In exchange for protection and technological spoils from raids, the Thralls provide their World Eaters allies with weapons, ammunition and equipment upgrades that result from their many experiments. The Tech Magi are also skilled forgers of demon engines, and the axes of the forge keep them supplied with the materials necessary to produce more of them. The Thralls hold colonies of enslaved sorcerers and witches below decks, collars of corn clamped around their necks until they are needed to summon the demons that will be bound within the inert engines prepared by the Tech Magi. Keeping so many psychic captives also enables the Thralls to forever develop anti-psychic technologies, which the Axes of the Forge make extensive use of. It takes more than bechain psychers to fashion demon engines, however. Binding always requires blood. The Axes of the Forge conduct countless slave raids to find enough worthy souls for their Dark Mechanicum allies to sacrifice to corn, as well as to anoint the mechanical monstrosities kept in their infernal menageries. The Eight Sons Eight world eaters who share the same birth mother. The Eight Sons were a part of the Great Blood Crusade that tore its way through the galaxy after the emergence of the Great Rift. They fought Tyranids and Orcs in the Octarian Empire in a weeks-long frenzy, but when their so-called blood wave that brought them there moved on, they were left behind. Not wanting to miss the continuing bloodshed of the Crusade, they decided to commit so much butchery that Corn would have to notice them, and so their reaping began. As they slaughtered, their many slaves toiled to strip flesh from the bones of the cold Xenos, arranging the copious volume of osseous matter in the symbol of corn. Each a mighty champion in their own right, the eight sons killed so many Xenos that reality itself flickered and tore. Sensing the eyes of their god upon them, the eight sons murdered their own slaves to hasten the opening of the warp rift. With every kill the portal widened, until finally it was large enough for them to stride through. On the other side, the brothers saw a great battle and charged in, roaring praises to the Blood God. Thus they travel across the galaxy still, from warp rift to warp rift, knowing their duty in one place is done when another bloody rent opens for them to charge through into the next conflict. 66th Armoured Company Known also as the Gore Treads and the Mollisons, many of the warriors of the Armoured Company are completely fused with the battle tanks they operate. Their neurosystems are entirely entwined with their vehicles, so that when they crush an enemy beneath their treads, it is as if they had crushed them with their own gauntlets. Despite being one with their armoured vehicles, the Gore Treads are as eager to get into the bloody fray of close quarters as any other world eater. Each of their tanks is covered with blades, spinning saws and chain flails, capable of tearing through not only ranks of infantry, but anti-tank obstacles and opposing vehicles. The Gore Treads are notorious throughout Ultima Segmentum, having annihilated Imperial Armoured Forces many times their number. Their greatest rivals are the Aurora Chapter, Ultramarine successors renowned for their huge formations of battle tanks and skill in armoured warfare. This enmity is said to extend back ten millennia to the now mysterious Battle of the Crimson Forge. To live as a world eater is to know little, besides constant pain, violence and death. For some of their number, existence itself is torture, the nails relentless pounding driving them to madness. To live as a world eater is to know little, 
besides constant death, violence and pain. For some of their number, existence itself is torture, with the nails relentless pounding and driving them to madness. Other world eaters embrace their suffering and welcome their rage, believing that resistance only makes it worse, or that an agony fueled existence is a pure form of cornate worship. To his worshippers, corn is uncomplicated, for he cares not from whence the blood flows. To a select few with the intellectual capacity and presence of mind to articulate this, accepting the inevitability of death and suffering is a recognition that nothing truly matters. They believe that losing oneself to slaughter and violence is to find the only true peace, and to be one with the truest state of the universe, its primal savagery. These individuals believe that when a being so fully aligns itself with the undercurrent of base aggression that has driven all living things from the very dawn of the universe, there is no longer suffering, for to them pain and misery are merely inevitable results if one attempts to resist the ways of reality. This notion puts the devotees of the blood god in fierce opposition with those of the other primary deities of the Chaos Pantheon. For the followers of Zench, the deeper they fall into their worship, the more complicated and elaborate life becomes. There is no peace in tracing and manipulating the myriad strands of fate. For those who devote themselves to Slanesh, and thus hedonism and excess, life is all about uh, feeling every sensation to its greatest extreme. And so for them, escaping from suffering to find peace is the precise opposite of what they seek to achieve. Perhaps there is least conflict between the ideals of Korn and Nurgle, but there is a lack of violent action in stagnation and decay that is insufferable to those of the Blood God's worshippers who seek the solace of slaughter. It must be said, however, that the path of glory, also known as the Road of Skulls by those who follow Korn, is a unique experience for all who take it. Few aspiring champions have enough presence of mind to see the potential for the white, hot purity of being and purpose that can be found when one achieves oneness with violence. Many on the path resist in one way or another. Perhaps they seek to maintain their identity or cannot shake off their desires for worldly power. For the least fortunate, they become hideously mutated chaos spawn, one might be forgiven for believing that becoming a mighty demon prince is a symbol of true ascendancy, but to the so-called sages of slaughter who seek the true solace of violence, even the demon prince is to be pitied, for they are forever trapped in this life by the nature of their own apotheosis. After losing themselves in violence time and again, sages of slaughter arrive at a mental physical and spiritual place where there is nothing but a flow state of killing. They become one with rage itself, and their hearts beat in time to the pulse of the butcher's nails. Yet the road to this point is long, narrow, steep and full of dangers. It begins with a world eater's nature as a space marine, a warrior psycho-conditioned to follow. Even if they throw off the yoke of one lord, they will eventually find another leader or cause to which they feel compelled to devote themselves. Some world eaters, especially those who become sages of slaughter, see this and accept it, uh, to a greater or lesser extent. By following Korn, who is said to view his servants as living weapons of slaughter without pretending otherwise, they choose to serve the deity they see as the most honest. The world eaters appreciate the straightforwardness of this arrangement. There is a simple purity in embodying the Blood God's creed. For those exhausted by their endless battle with the butcher's nails, this sense of purpose can run deeper still, so that some warriors seek the oblivion of succumbing utterly to the device's demands for slaughter. Such psycho-spiritual journeys lead some sons of Angron to a place of solace in slaughter. Most will fail on the way, some killed, some captured, some hideously mutated. But those who remain become warrior hermits who live by killer instinct alone. They appear without warning where skulls pile high and blood flows deep. 
Such is their aura of implacable will and elemental furiosity that they can stride aboard a Chaos Champion's ship and none will bar their path. The sages of slaughter care naught for anything of the material world. They are indifferent to the gradual disintegration of their weapons and armour and do not gather war bands of their own, for leadership and power are wasteful distractions to them. To some world eaters they are the Nihilans, the unblemished, the pure or the primer souls. But they are no collective, for they are as likely to kill each other as to fight side by side. Though they reject command, many of them gain awed devotees who desperately wish to follow them. Romua the Relentless, Gorora of the Free Swords, and Amorous Firefist are each followed by hundreds of warriors, all aching for but a shred of the solace these individuals have achieved for themselves, or else missing the point entirely and hoping that following a sage of slaughter will earn them great glory. And after that very sombre, serious, and rather philosophical and spiritual view of corn worship, I will say goodbye. Thank you to everybody watching the channel. Please do give the video a like and a comment, as doing both those things really helps me and the channel grow, and I really, really appreciate that. Uh, thank you to everybody supporting the channel. Your names are scrolling by here. You are the producers. You are the big help that helps this get done, that helps me out every month, and I really, really appreciate that. I hope you... I hope you like the, uh, up. Oh, I'm doing more videos. I hope you like it. <laughs> Expect more to come. I'll be doing a lot more as we go along, at least once a week, like I said, and I mean it this time. But uh, if you would like to support the channel, I would really appreciate that. Please consider becoming a patron on Patreon or a YouTube member, whichever you find easier. Uh, really, really appreciate it. And to everybody who sent Super Chats and all that, honestly, from the bottom of my heart, I cannot thank you enough. I will be back Oh, I just hit something. I will be back again soon. I thought that last section there on the nature of corn worship was pretty sick. I really like it. And um, the uh, Chosen of Corn audio, that's what it's called, isn't it? It's not the Eightfold Path. That's a different one. The Chosen of Corn audio book. Uh, I'll put a link in the description to it on Audible. Uh, so use my link. Yeah. But if you can get a hold of that, uh, you'll really enjoy it. It's really good. I do like, I like a lot of the chaos stuff because... I think a lot of it's quite clever. And if you're um if you're interested in that kind of uh stuff, like anywhere, like mythology and uh, philosophy and stuff like that, there's a lot of fun stuff in chaos worship, I think, and I think it's quite funny and entertaining and unintent well, perhaps intentionally, but like it's got these little moments you think, ah, oh, that's pretty good. I mean, this is quite close to sort of um Buddhism or Taoism and stuff like this, you know, like seeking peace through oblivion from the uh you know, the, the the cycle of life, you know, you ascend. Anyway, it doesn't matter. I'm just going to, I'm going to go now because I'll just start ranting about stuff I don't fully comprehend. I will be back again very, very soon. I hope you enjoyed this. I did a, I did a World Eaters video a long time ago, um, but it was mostly like the old law, sort of pre-Horus Heresy. So this is updated with new stuff, you know, and uh, where the, the, the uh, World Eaters are now. So yeah, uh, really good stuff. I'll be back again with more good stuff later on. Thanks very much for watching. Ta-ra. Bye-bye.